We welcome all of our video uh, participants today, and we thank you for being a part of our Bible study. This is the Cove Bible Advance, Conyers, Georgia. I'm Pastor Richard Davis, and uh, this is, uh, what day is this? The June 12th. June the 12th. Okay, I lose track of time when I'm having fun. Uh, June the 12th, so we welcome all of you, and we pray that uh, the things that are going to transpire in the next uh, few minutes will be of importance to you and that the Lord will be able to speak to your heart. Occupy till he comes is our title today. And as I just stated, Jesus hung on the cross, suffered, having been beaten, having been crowned with thorns, having been uh, nailed to his hands and his feet having suffered the ridicule and much, much other embarrassments and, and, and uh, trouble. And at a point he said, it is finished. finished. Now, my question to you is, what was finished? His assignment. His task. His assignment. His assignment was finished. Okay. What was finished? You must like Pat's answer. Mm -hmm. What did he say? He said his assignment. The Lord said his assignment. That's what I said. And that's certainly true. His his assignment on earth in that particular segment was finished. But was Jesus finished? No. No. Not by a long shot. No. So he was not saying, I am finished. That's not what he was saying. But some church people have thought that's what he was saying. But he wasn't. He was not saying that he was finished because he is actually doing more now than he was for those few years on earth. That's right. That was important. That was necessary. That Without that, that we wouldn't even be here. But the fact is, he was not done, that was just the preliminary stages of more to come. He has been at the right hand of the Father, you know, for these many years since that, but before even that, when he gave up the ghost on the cross, they buried his body, his spirit went to the regions of the dead, and there he was quickened by the Spirit and resurrected, came out of hell and came out of death, came out of the tomb with the kings of hell and of death. And he led captivity captive. So he was not finished. Now I want to talk to you a little bit today about where we are, where he is, and what time it is in relationship to the great plan of God. Now, in Luke chapter 19, verses 12 through 13, we find these words. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return again. And he called his servants and delivered them his goods and said, Occupy till I come. Now the word occupy means to take care of business. It means boots on the ground. Uh, militarily, if you have an occupying force, that means that the battle... The war has been won and that they are in place for maintenance and progress purposes. So we understand that when Jesus gave this parable, he was talking about himself. It was a parable about him. He was the one who went into a far country to receive a kingdom and to return. And that is exactly when he delivered his blood to the mercy seat of God, the throne, 
And God accepted the once and for all price for humanity and for the transgression of Adam and Eve. Then the last Adam, Jesus Christ, became the new head of the human family. Or at least those who would be born again of the Spirit to enter into God's family. So, in this parable, we have a statement, Occupy until I come. Now, Christ is coming back. He said he would, and he most certainly will. As a matter of fact, I think he is in the process of coming now. Amen. Mm -hmm. I think that things are shaping up for his return. Amen. And uh, so what is our part? Because we are to be occupation forces or we are to occupy and take care of business until he comes. That's not a suggestion. That is a command. So we need to understand how we are supposed to take care of business. Now, in Luke chapter 2, verse 49, we find these words. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? Jesus said this to Mary and Joseph. They had gone to the city to take care of, I think it was taxes or something. They had gone for some purpose, some reason. Jesus at this time was 12 years old. They left the city and went back on their way. He was a very mature 12-year-old. They did not worry about him. They went with the caravan and headed back. And for three days, after they realized that they, he was not with them, for three days they searched for him. Finally, when they came back, and they went to the temple, there he was, sitting amongst the doctors and the lawyers and the, the teachers of, that, of, the, of the temple, and uh, questioning with them. And the Bible says that they all marveled at him. But when his mother and stepfather, as it were, came to him and said, Why have you dealt thusly with us? You worried us. We, we were looking for you. You know, I'm just putting that in modern vernacular. And, uh, you know, wh why have you done this? And he looked at them with a question, and he said, What? Didn't you assume that I had to be about my father's business? Don't you know who I am? If anybody knew who he was, it ought to be her. And, and, and Joseph. They ought to know. And he said, don't you know I'm supposed to be about my father's business? Why? Why are you concerned about me? Now, it's interesting that he said that sitting in the temple. My father's business. Now, God loves the world. But his business is the souls of men. Jesus was sitting in the middle of God's business. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And he said to them, I'm taking care of business. Well, he was not, he was a pre-teenager. He was not at all uh, anointed yet. Well, I mean, he, I'm sure he had, he was born with a certain anointing, but he had not been released by Father God, and he was not in his ministry yet, but his heart was there, Amen. and his head was there, yes. and more importantly, his spirit was there. So he was taking care of Father's business. Then he gave the parable before he died. This was uh, the week that he died when he gave him the parable of a nobleman going to a far country to receive a kingdom and then coming again and and admonishing his his staff to 
take care of business. Occupy till I come. Now in Hebrews chapter 2, and if you want to turn there with me, you can. It's a lengthy, well, it's not lengthy, it's just was more than I had space to write it. So Hebrews chapter 2, I'm going to get, begin with verse 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? This was David in Psalms 8 that wrote this. Now, now thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hand. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all things in subject, uh, subjection under him. He left nothing that was not put under him. But now we see that not yet all things are put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom all things are, and by whom all things are, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them Brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, and I will sing praise unto thee. Now, I want you to see with me that it starts out quoting Psalms where David is talking about mankind. Adam, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? He's talking about Adam and Adam's responsibility over planet earth. He was here to take care of business. The father's business. But we get down to the bottom of verse 8 where he says God put all things under Adam's dominion. But we see that right now things are not yet all under submission. In other words, Adam did not subdue the earth. He did not take charge and take care of the Father's business. He lost the kingdom. And a new headship came into the kingdom by default. A default headship. Sometimes we get default headship. Now then, Jesus came as the last Adam, and Jesus came to put indeed all things under the dominion of God's representatives in the earth, and he did it by suffering and dying and becoming indeed the last Adam and was resurrected, and when he was resurrected, that quickening of the spirit in the region of the dead, God said that day, according to the book of Acts, God said that day, this day have I begotten thee. So God begot him twice. He was born by the Holy Spirit from the womb of Mary, but God begot him by the Spirit, Jesus I'm talking about, from the dead when he physically died and on that day, God said, you are my son. He was resurrected by the Spirit. He was born again by the Spirit, Jesus. He, he never stopped being the Son of God, but he went through this for us vicariously because we needed it, not him. So, now, the Bible says in this scripture that we are one with him if we've been born again. We are one with him, and he is not ashamed to call us brethren. Or sisters, as the case may be. Brethren. 
In the spirit there is no gender. So what we understand here is that we are to have a unity and a oneness that the church seems to be missing right now. I'm not talking about us in this room. I'm talking about the church at large. So let's examine this a little bit because how can we take care of business? How are we going to get all those, all the pieces to the map like I described to you a while ago if we don't work together? Now, in Romans chapter 8, if you will, turn to Romans chapter 8 with me. Uh, I want to read uh, verses 29, start with verse 29. And it says, For whom he did foreknow, yes, sir. he also did predestinate, but, you know, that's the Old Testament way to say predestined. Uh, he predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. Conformed to the image of his son. Be like Jesus. Those whom he did foreknow, he predestinated. Now let me explain this to you. Foreknowledge and predestination are two different things. You, you've heard me say this before. Because God knows everything does not mean that he, pre, he predetermines that it has to be that way. Because if that was the case, why would he give man the power to choose? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, he said he foreknew that a people would be conformed to his image because that a, a group of people was debt predestined to be conformed to his image. That don't mean that he chose the individuals. It means that we get to choose if we're going to be a part of that. But he chooses that that's going to be. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like God drawing a circle and said that circle is to be. You, you decide if you're going to step in it or not. Okay. Okay, for whom he did foreknow, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. The firstborn. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, he, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. That what we then say, what shall we then say to these things? What things? Things he was just talking about. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now one translation says it this way. If God be for us, who can stand against us? Because we have an enemy. We have enemies. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. But none of them can stand before us if we are one in Christ. Hello. Mm -hmm. So he says here that uh, he starts working on this group that is supposed to be conformed to the image. And the confirmation of, or the conforming process is that uh, he, he uh, calls them, he justifies them, and he glorifies them. Now, that, you remember when the Bible says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? That, you know, it goes on saying, Thou crownest him with glory, glory, and glory, and honor. That means that that aura, that covering, was upon Adam. And here it says, If we're going to be like the last Adam, then we're going to be called, we're going to be justified, and we're going to be glorified or are we going to have to put on the covering or the the glorious relationship aura that we need and when we do that God is for us and who can stand against us you see that God is saying you have to come into agreement and into unity and be one that was Jesus' prayer in John 17 before he, he left. Father, make them one as we are one. 
That was his last prayer over his disciples. Mm -hmm. Father, make them one. And I pray not for these only, but for all of them that shall hear my words through them. Mm -hmm. You see that? Mm -hmm. Now then, so we are to be conformed to his image by the process of re or, or moving toward the glorious covering because we are one with him. See, on the day of Pentecost, when the baptism of the Holy Spirit came upon those believers, they all looked like Jesus spilling out of that room. The devil got really confused, I imagine. He thought he killed one, and now there's 120 more of them. Because they were so like him. They had the same spirit. They had his spirit. And the devil, did. He, I mean, he went tilt on that day. Now listen. John 1, 16. And of his fullness we have all received. There for years went a humility message around in the church. And everybody got sort of mealy mouth. They just were just so humble and so unworthy and so, uh, you, you know, you know what I'm saying. Because we felt like that is, oh, that is, we are nothing. He is everything. No, you are supposed to be like him. The Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and humbled himself, even unto death, the death of the cross. We have to step up and realize that we identify with Christ. When he was on the cross, you were in him. When he went to hell, you were in him. When he resurrected, you were in him. When he went to the right hand of the Father, you were in him. All of that happened retroactively when you got born again. When you got born again, you were in him as though you had been in him all along, as if you had died, as if you had been resurrected, as if you, you were in him because he did it for you. Do you see that? Oneness. Now, we, of his fullness, 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 we have all received. Remember I tell you, God is a pourer. He, he measures things by fullness. The fruit has to be full before it's picked. The, 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 those uh, urns that were going to be water turned to wine, they had to be full before the miracle uh, was ready to take place. The, I mean, there's a fullness, a maturity. That has to come. Fullness. Of his fullness. We have all received. Now. Let's develop that just a little bit. John chapter 3. Verse 34 says. For God giveth not. The spirit. By measure. Unto him. Remember when he was in the Jordan River. Baptized by John. Comes up out of the water, the heavens open, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove comes out of heaven, lights upon him. And the Bible says the Spirit led him up out of the water into the wilderness. And then he was there for 40 days and 40 nights and was, you know, tempted by the devil and all that. I'm not going to get into that, it's not my message. He comes back victorious, and the Bible says, and he came back led by the Spirit. That's the day his ministry began, because when that Spirit came upon him, the Father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved Son, and who I... that was an announcement. This is him. He's taking charge. That's when his ministry began. Not at the age of 12. It was in his heart at 12, but it was not in his hands at 12. Now it's in his hands. And now he's going to really take care of some business. Okay. So that is the fullness. That fullness of the Spirit that came upon him. That is, 
That was the beginning of his fullness. And the Bible says that that spirit was not given to him by measure. It was an overflowing outpouring. Mm -hmm. Now then, the word fullness there comes from the word, and you've heard me teach this word before, pleru, P-L-E-R-O-O, -O, pleru. And it means a copiousness. It means to be crammed full and overflowing. It means completely full and fully complete. It is as the wind billows the sail on the ship and fills it up, but there's much more wind than that sail can hold. It just billows out with the fullness. That is the where you get the term pleru. It is that kind of fullness. It's, it's not enough. It's way more than enough. There's plenty of wind to blow all the ships. You see what I'm saying? Now, of His fullness... We have all received. Now this is not a shallow message. I hope that you, you're buckled up because we got to occupy till he comes. Amen. Mm -hmm. that. Yes. Text. Colossians 2.9 For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and Ye are complete in Him. Because that is the fullness that you're partaking of. Yes, sir. Say it again. You said, For in Him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Yeah. Godhead bodily is the same. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Okay. Which are three. three? They three are one. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. They are three. Yet they are one. Mm -hmm. Yes. That is a mind bender, but it's still true. Well, that, 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 that's the essence. Colossians 1.19 For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. Now then, look at Ephesians chapter 1. Turn over there with me if you want to. If you don't, I'm going to read it anyway. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1. And let's start looking at verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you, give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling. Why is His calling important? Because it's also your calling because you are in Him. And you see, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that world which is to come and hath put all things under his feet where God put them under Adam to begin with, and Adam was to develop that, but he didn't. And he gave him to be the head over all things, just like
like Adam was supposed to be the head, the last Adam is the head. All over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So the church is to exemplify and walk in the fullness of the head of the body because the church is the body. If I eat something, my feet get it too. Hello. The head is nothing without the body. Jesus took possession to a whole new level. You know, demons want to possess somebody. Jesus is possessing the whole church <laughs> in the sense of his spirit. And he at the right hand of the Father sits in headship. He is there expecting us to occupy until he comes. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his voice. We are his body. Amen. Amen. Now then, Ephesians chapter 4, flip a page or two over, and in verse 11, this is just after Jesus has resurrected from the dead, the Bible says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, that means the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Working the ministry. That's taking care of business. See, ministry is not just in church. It's not just in the, in the house. Ministry is out in the street. Mm -hmm. Ministry is where you find people. Everywhere you find people. That's where you find ministry. That's true. It says, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, which is the church. Till... We all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or a mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we be no more henceforth children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sly of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth, which is the word, in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, I don't know how it can be told any plainer than that, quite frankly. We are supposed to mature and grow up and be so like him that the world thinks we are him. Hello. Mm -hmm. That's occupying till he comes. God says, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. You see, this is where the feet are going to dominate the enemy. Remember the garden prophecy? Serpent, snake. You're going to have to deal with the feet of her seed. Come on now. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to deal with the feet of her seed. And you're going to strike him. But he's going to step on your head. Kindergartners don't march. Armies march with their feet. They That's do right. it in order and design. Mm -hmm. They're occupying force. Hello. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. We have so many churches, like in my family, come up in Baptist that didn't believe in the Pentecost works. They didn't believe in that that was for, for these days. That was for them days. And they didn't believe us for those for these days. Right. So where do they where, where we stand? Well, 
Just because they don't believe it don't make it not true. That's right. Well, a lot of people don't accept the Pentecostal experience. Of well, that, you know, we get a choice to believe what we choose to believe. And, and that, you know, like I say, and I've, you heard me say this before, uh, only 120 went to the other room, upper room, upwards of 500 saw him resurrected. So there's 380 that are not spirit filled out there <laughs> somewhere yeah. who were who, who who believed in his resurrection and believed in his in him being Christ, but they didn't get the spirit because they weren't there. You see what I'm saying? Some got it, some didn't. But without the but without it, you outside. Well, let's don't let's don't I, I'm coming to you. Yeah. Let's don't confuse the fact of speaking in tongues being the plumb line by which you determine if someone has right. the spirit. I didn't say anything about speaking in tongues. Okay. I said the Pentecostal experience of the Russian mind. But when men, the Bible says Jesus the said of the spirit is what I'm talking about. But your Bible says no man cometh to the Father except Jesus, or except the Spirit, draw him. No man cometh unto the Father except the Spirit. What Spirit is that he's talking about? If you are drawn to the Father, it's by the Holy Ghost. Now, I believe there's different dimensions yes. of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Yep. But just because you're not running up and down and shouting and speaking in tongues and and operating in all the gifts does not mean that the Spirit of God didn't get you born again. See, Jesus got born again by the Spirit, but he didn't get baptized in the Spirit till the day that he was in the Jordan River. And that was for ministry purposes. Well, I, I just I just focus how the Baptist said told us that they didn't need the Pentecostal experience. Well, they're wrong. <laughs> they're wrong. Uh, and and, the, and the, the fact is, uh, the more you get close to him, the more you want that. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Yes, sir. I just want to compliment what you said. Uh, Brother Leslie, what you have to realize is there are a group called cessationists. And I know you already know that, Pastor. They just don't believe what? Cessationists. C-E-S-S. -S cessationists. Yes. They don't believe in it. And what you want to do, whenever you hear somebody's beliefs in anything, Jehovah's Witness or something, research like old President Nixon used to say, follow them. Up. Follow to how they developed it and why they believe it, and you might be startled. There's an old saying, like, I, I when I got saved, I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit within one month. I mean, I was saved on June 14, 1984, in the office of Pastor Dan Rose, and the next month, I wanted it. I know you couldn't keep me from it. I got it before water baptism, and I was always told you had to first get water baptized and then the Holy Spirit. I wanted it. But the fact is, if some people don't want it, don't. It's up to them. That's between them and God, but if you want it, my problem is, I'm sure the pastor agrees, is when they decide to keep you out the door, almost like Jesus said, whoa, you Pharisees, they want to go into the door and you want to keep them out. If they don't want to give the spirit, that's fine. But if other people want it and they keep them out, then they're in trouble. But you, you do agree see what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Jesus was born of the spirit. Yes. At birth. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit was his father. He also was quickened by the Spirit in hell and resurrected. He was also baptized not only in water but in the Holy Spirit in Jordan. So that mm -hmm. there are there are differences of dominion or, or of operations of the Spirit. All of the gifts of the Spirit are indeed the gifts of the Spirit. They're not the gifts of the believer. They operate in the life of the believer because you the tree that he bears fruit on. Mm -hmm. The fruit and the and the gifts are an operation of the spirit. But you cannot you cannot tell God or you cannot tell people for that matter that they are not saved or born again if they have not confessed the what we call the baptism of the Holy Spirit because he is the agent of their new birth to begin with. No man comes to the Father except the Spirit draws him. And, and when the Spirit draws him, you're going to come to the Father through Jesus. Because the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. 
And that's the fullness that we're talking about. You, see, you get to choose mm -hmm. how close you get to God. That's God true. doesn't make robots out of people and make you grow up or make you get close to Him. You know, you, if you had brothers and sisters in your family, they were all at some level of relationship with mom and dad. That's true. And that was between them and their mom and dad. And it wasn't determined by you. You're the brother or the sister. You, that's not your call. That's between them. And they were all, if my mother was a genius. Every time you got around her, you know, she'd make you feel like, you're my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> you're my favorite. <laughs> and they want another get around, you are my favorite. <laughs> Because they were all her favorites. And I like to feel that way about, about the Lord. I'm his favorite, you know. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. So are you. But the fact is that that's, you know, that's an individual thing. There are different dimensions of the operation of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Everybody doesn't have the same depth, the same experience. But if you are born again, you didn't get there without the operation of the Spirit. Now, if you want to go on and have the gifts operating and stuff like that, then by all means do so. And 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 I've had the gifts operating in me. I've had every one of the gifts operating in me across the years at one time or another. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. And I'd like to think that I have the fruit of the Spirit operating consistently all the time. Mm -hmm. Because the fruit's actually more important than the gifts. That's but anyway, true. Okay. Of his fullness, we have all received. Now then, let's go on here. Look with me, if you will, for just a moment in your, in your mind's eye to the book of Acts chapter 27. That's talking about the Apostle Paul. When the Apostle Paul had had the experience of salvation on the road to Damascus, he gave his heart to God, went into the wilderness, spent that three years with the Lord, uh, came out, uh, called an apostle, uh, full of the Spirit, having been caught up to the third, I mean, all, and his preaching, there is no depth of preaching in the Bible outside of Jesus that is any deeper than the Apostle Paul. The man was gifted of God. But the fact is, he was trying to be like Jesus. Oh, that I may know him. Oh, that I may know him. Know him. I want to know him. Paul knew him as good as anybody that you can find in the Bible. But he wanted to know him more. He said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. That means you're going all the way when you do that. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. We're told that we're to be one with him. We're to occupy till he comes. We're to be like him. We are, are, are supposed to draw from his fullness. Now, look at Paul. Look at, look at Paul in comparison with Jesus. Jesus was on a ship. The storm came, was battling the ship. Was you know, Jesus took authority over the storm. As a matter of fact, he had authority over the storm before the storm ever came. He was sleeping through the storm. They let him alone. He slept all the way to the other side. They were not going to sink because he'd already told them they were going to the other side. They just did. They lost track of what he said by what they see. Never let what you see make you forget what he said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Never let what you see make you forget what he said. Mm -hmm. That's good. And so he calmed the sea. Look at Paul. Paul was on the ship. Storm came up. Everybody on the ship was terrified. They were trying to jump ship. Just like a lot of folks today. The old ship of Zion, there's a lot of folks trying to jump ship. <laughs> Paul said, Fear not, brethren. Paul was not afraid. He said,
said, the angel of the Lord stood by me this night and told me that he was going to give me every person on the, on this ship, to all 276 of them, 275 of them. He said, you're going to get saved because I'm on the ship, because God's got me on a mission and i got to go to Rome. Now, you're going to lose your ship because you shouldn't have sailed. I told you not to, but you did. <laughs> so you're going to lose your ship, but you're not going to lose your life if you stay on the ship until the ship breaks up. Well, now that, that's tough. But look, Paul was suddenly the authority, the nautical authority when the storm got rough. Jesus was the authority when the storm those disciples didn't need Jesus on that water. They stayed on the water all day. They were fishermen and stuff. They, they weren't afraid as long as the waters were calm. It wasn't until the storm hit that they needed him. Well, it wasn't until the, till, till the storm hit that the soldiers and the sailors on Paul's ship needed him. But he, like Jesus, stood up and said, Calm down, everybody. This is all under control. How can you say it's out of control when this ship has been beat to pieces? Because God said so. That's right. Amen. Don't let what you see make you forget what, what he, he said. said. <laughs> now here's the thing. If we indeed are going to be of his fullness and like him, our ship is in a storm. Storm is raging. But there's going to be cool, calm people that's going to not be afraid. They're going to say, mm -hmm. Hey, settle down. God's got this. Amen. Mm -hmm. Trust Him. Amen. You'll be all right.